No Talking, Chapter 14, Seen But Not Heard The homebound school buses were quieter than usual on Tuesday afternoon, especially the ones hauling a large number of fifth grade kids. But none of the fifth graders found the ride home very hard. With no grown-ups around, it was pretty easy to keep quiet. A few of them sat with friends and passed notes back and forth. Some read books or opened a notebook and did homework. Most of the fifth graders just sat quietly, looking and listening, and thinking. For the fifth graders like Lindsay, who stayed for soccer or field hockey or cross country, after school was just like regular school because the coaches were all teachers, and you could answer teachers because of the three-word rule. Everyone was getting pretty good at that part of the contest. Soccer practice was easy for Lindsay. Instead of yelling for the ball like she sometimes did, she just waved a hand or made a motion with her head. To direct teammates to cover an area or move downfield, she pointed. Lindsay was good at soccer. She did most of her communicating with her feet. For the kids like Dave, who went right home after school, not talking was more difficult, a lot more difficult, because it's a fact of nature that parents don't like it when kids don't answer them. David? David had been home five minutes when he heard his mom come in the front door and call his name. He was upstairs, in the bathroom. She called again. David, answer me. To be more specific, Dave was sitting on the toilet. David, answer me. Dave knew that tone of voice. He had to do something right away, so he reached over and banged on the inside of the bathroom door. It was the wrong move. His mom was up those front stairs and had both hands on that locked bathroom doorknob in two seconds. David, is that you? Are you all right? David, David, answer me. She was going to kick the, do the door down. Dave was sure of it. He jiggled the doorknob, flushed the toilet, and was up and zipped and buttoned, all in about two seconds, and he yanked the door open and gave his mom the best smile he could manage. Mrs. Packer was so relieved that she bent down and hugged Dave so hard that he couldn't have said a word even if he wanted to, which he didn't. But then she held him out in front of her and gave him a stern look. Didn't you hear me calling you? It would have been easy to shake his head no and tell a silent lie, but Dave smiled and shrugged and held out his hands. Then he pointed at his mouth. His mom frowned even more. Your throat? Is your throat sore? Is that it? Dave shook his head. But it's hard to talk. Something hurts. Should I call Dr. O'Hara's office? We can drive right over there. Dave shook his head again and motioned for his mom to follow him. He went to his room and then to his desk. And on a piece of paper, he wrote, Sorry, it's a thing we're doing at school, not talking for a couple of days. That's all. His mom looked at the paper. Not talking, she said. Don't be silly. Everybody has to talk. Dave smiled and shrugged, and he wrote, not all the time. His mom tilted her head back and made a face at him, nodding slowly. Oh, so you're saying that I talk all the time, is that it? Again, Dave smiled and shrugged. Because I can be as quiet as anybody, then she added, if I wanted to. Bending over to pick up a sweatshirt, she pushed it into his arms and said, well, anyway, get the rest of these dirty clothes picked up and go downstairs and start a load in the washer. Only the dark colors, all right? Dave made a face, and she said, And don't give me any of that sass, mister. At his karate class, Kyle did a front snap kick without a yell. Mr. Hudson bowed and said, Kyle-san, always yell like this when you kick. hi -ya. Now you. Kyle did the kick again, and he moved his face and mouth, but he didn't yell. Mr. Hudson's face got red, and he walked stiffly like he always does when he was displeased, but he was still being polite because that is the karate way. He bowed. Kyle-san, did you not hear me? Ben Ellis walked onto the mat and bowed to Mr. Hudson. He was in the fourth grade. When Mr. Hudson bowed back, Ben said, Hudson-san, the fifth grade kids aren't talking. None of them. Hudson-san bowed and made a wise face and tried to imagine what the teacher in the movie The Karate Kid would say in this situation. And after a long pause, he said, Ah, I see. Yes, silence. It is good. Then he bowed at Kyle-san, and Kyle-san bowed back. Then Kyle did another snap kick, without yelling. Ellen played the first flute piece for her teacher, but there was a problem. Mrs. Lennox said, all right, we're in 4-4 time here. She used her pencil and pointed at the quarter rest. How many beats of silence do you allow for this rest? Ellen tapped once on the music stand. Her teacher said, Correct, but just say one beat. Then Mrs. Lennox pointed at the symbol for a whole rest. And how many beats for this one? Ellen tapped out four beats. Just say four beats, dear. 
Helen smiled and tapped four times, and then pointed at her mouth and shook her head. What? asked Mrs. Lennox. Again, Ellen pointed at her mouth and shook her head. Your lips? Something about your lips? asked the teacher. Just tell me, dear. Ellen smiled and shook her head. Then she lifted the flute to her lips and played the piece again, and this time she read all the rests perfectly. Her teacher nodded, smiled, and then turned the page to the next piece. Before Ellen began to play, Mrs. Lennox pointed at each rest and Ellen tapped out the right number of beats. The teacher nodded and Ellen began to play. When she finished, Mrs. Lennox smiled, pointed at the start of the piece, picked up her own flute, nodded, and they played the whole piece again as a duet. Neither of them said a word for the rest of the lesson. <clears throat> Brian's mom picked him up at school, and when he got in the hair, she said, You need a haircut. We're stopping at Zeke's on the way home. Brian groaned and shook his head. He stamped his feet on the floor of the car. His mom kept driving. Brian hated going to Zeke's modern barber shop. Zeke was this grumpy guy who'd been cutting hair in Layton for more than 40 years. He gave everyone the same haircut, short on top and buzzed close on the sides. But the last two times he'd been there, Brian had forced Zeke to do a halfway decent job, but only because he practically yelled at the man the whole time. Not so short on top. No, really, that's enough off the top. And don't use the clippers on the sides, just scissors. There, that's enough. Don't cut off any more. Really, no, please, no, clipper, no clippers. Just use scissors, please. And that's why today was the wrong day for a haircut. If Zeke got him into that worn-out barber chair, Brian knew he'd end up looking like something that had escaped from the zoo. When his mom parked the car, Brian jumped out and dashed into the pizza place next to the barber shop. But his mom followed him. He pointed at the menu, but she shook her head. There's no time for a snack. We have to pick up your sister in 15 minutes. She took him by the arm and pulled him out of the restaurant and over to Zeke's door. Now get in there. Quick. There's no line right now. Brian wanted to say, Newsflash, Mom, there's never a line at Zeke's. The man's a rotten barber and he has bad breath. But Brian couldn't say that, and he wouldn't be able to talk to Zeke either. He was doomed. Fifteen minutes later, when his big sister got into the car, she took one look at Brian and burst out laughing. She said, Zeke, right? Brian could only nod. He had paid a heavy price for keeping his mouth shut, but he'd kept his promise to Dave and the other guys. And if they didn't beat the girls, well, it wasn't going to be his fault. And he had the bad haircut to prove it. Was it worth it? Yeah, he thought. It was worth it. So what if I look like a monkey for a week, or two, or three? Brian stared out the side window and tried not to think about it. Mrs. Burgess was worried. She glanced in the rearview mirror and looked at her daughter's face again and thought, Did she have a horrible day at school? Is that what's bothering her? Or maybe something happened at soccer practice? That coach of hers can be pretty rough. About a month earlier, Lindsay had started riding in the back seat of the car instead of up front. Her mom had noticed that her bright, chatty little girl was starting to become more serious, sort of distant now and then. And today, not even a word, and barely a nod as she got into the car after practice. Lindsay's mom thought, maybe she's giving me the silent treatment because I said she couldn't go to that sleepover at Kelly's this weekend. That's probably it. Kids can be so moody sometimes. Goodness knows I was. The truth is, Lindsay wasn't feeling moody at all. She was just thinking. Actually, she was thinking about thinking. Not talking all afternoon had made her realize something. For years now, she had done most of her thinking out loud. I've just been blurting out whatever's on my mind. To my sister, to my mom, and at school. I just go on and on. And then I talk on the phone all night. Incredible. Lindsay hated to admit it. But Dave Packer might have been right about the top of her head exploding, because that's how it had felt at first. She felt like a faucet had been wide open, gushing and gushing forever, and then suddenly it flipped shut, and all her thoughts had been bottled up. But by the time school let out, Lindsay had started to enjoy the cha change, and all during soccer practice, she'd felt like she was alone, just her and her own voice. And she'd felt like saying, Hi there, I'm Lindsay. Remember me? I live here thinking, and being quiet. It was different, and it was good. As the car turned onto their street, almost home, she looked up and saw her mom's eyes in the car mirror, and instantly felt how worried she was. So Lindsay gave her mom a wave and a big smile, and her mom smiled back. All over town, the other fifth graders were figuring out how to get along without talking. Were there any mistakes made on Tuesday afternoon? Yes, but only a few. Every single fifth grade girl and boy 
was working hard not to talk. And later on, as it got to be dinner time and family time and homework time and bedtime, there were other problems the kids faced. A phone call from grandma, a little brother who needed help with homework, a family trip to the mall for new shoes, lots of situations that begged for spoken words. Every single kid had unusual experiences on Tuesday night, and every single kid had to be creative and alert and quiet. But it's not time to tell about all that. It's time to go back to school, back in time to, to about 3.30 on Tuesday afternoon, back to the conference room next to the office, because that's where the principal and the fifth grade teachers had held a special meeting, and they'd had plenty to talk about.